We'll be in 1 Samuel 16 again. Can't get away from the story of David lately. I uh, teaching it in junior church, and so I decided we would uh, go through these lessons on David while my mind was on it. And then um, with my wife, I'm reading through the Psalms right now, or we're reading through the Psalms right now and devotions. And with Daisy, uh, this last week we've been in her little Bible right through the story of David. <laughs> it's like, can't get away from it. But it's good. Uh, causes you to think a lot on it. So we started a little series on 12 key moments or key times, uh, pivotal uh, times or happenings in the life of David. And the first week we discussed, or the first couple of weeks, we discussed David in the field watching his father's sheep. And last week we started. Was it, last? it was just one week last week, right? Okay. Last week was a little uh, interesting. So we started into David being anointed as the king of Israel, and we got a little sidetracked onto uh, dress standards based upon Samuel viewing David's brothers from the outward, and uh, so hopefully we won't get down another rabbit trail again this week. Go ahead and try to finish this lesson, but we'll pray before we begin. Lord, again, we ask for wisdom as we look at your word. Please help us to be different from the world. Lord, help us to desire to stand out, to point people to you in our community, and Pray that you would work in our church, work in our hearts, our lives, and our families. Pray for uh, the children that they would learn in their classes today. And pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we discussed a little bit uh, how Saul was rejected from being the king of Israel because of his disobedience to the Lord, and the Bible says, that God called it rebellion, uh, not just disobedience, but that Saul uh, was rebellious against God's plan. He offered a burnt offering, which was not his place. And I was reminded as I read over the, uh, the story again how the Bible says right after Right after Sam or Saul offers this sacrifice, Samuel shows up. And it's like, if you'd have just had a little bit more patience. Um, and I thought how often it is that we wait and wait sometimes on God's timing. Because Saul did wait seven days. And after seven days, I think I'd have been a little impatient too. Like, okay, Samuel, where are you? Um, so he waits seven days, but then he gets impatient. And uh, goes ahead and Samuel shows up right afterwards. But uh, between that, that story and when he did not destroy the Amalekites like he was supposed to, God rejects Saul from being the king. And so Samuel is sent to anoint a new king. And uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16, we'll read a few verses here. Verse 6, And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab, and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shammah to pass by, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. Uh, and we'll, we'll keep reading here in a little bit. But uh, So, so these, these sons of Jesse come before Samuel, and Samuel sees Eliab, the oldest, and assumes 
that this is God's choice. Um, natural thing, you know, you see uh, the oldest, uh, probably, you know, somewhat of a leader. We see him uh, outspoken in a later story where David goes to the battle of the Philistines. And Samuel sees the outward appearance and he he assumes who God's choice is. He, he, he attempts to determine that for himself. And God says, no, uh, that's, not, that's not who I've chosen. Uh, God has refused him. God has rejected Eliab based upon his inward character. God sees the heart. And it's interesting, uh, we'll look at a few things here. It's interesting what, as we go through the story of David, some attributes of Eliab that we, we see, and pretty uh, opposite of David. And God knew who Eliab was on the inside. And so the first thing that we see, a character flaw, a big character flaw in Eliab, is uh, cowardice. And we see that in 1 Samuel 17. 1 <clears throat> Samuel 17, uh, verse 21. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words. And David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. Well, Eliab was one of these men. Uh, Eliab was at the battle along with his two uh, next oldest brothers. In contrast to what we see in David, <laughs> uh, I mean, you, you can say, who would fault him? I mean, the whole nation of Israel, the whole army of Israel is fleeing from Goliath. Saul, King Saul himself, who's head and shoulders above uh, the rest of Israel in stature, he wasn't fighting Goliath. Nobody's stepping out. And so we see this, uh, this cowardice or at least a willingness to just go with the flow uh, in Eliab. Uh, another thing that we see in Eliab is a poor evaluation of character. And we see this in verse 28. And this is uh, just, just, we'll keep reading here. Verse 25, And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that is come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. So they're now offering um, reward for Whoever fights Goliath. And David spake to the men that stood by him. Can you imagine the, the uh, conviction, the um, what would you say? Irritation <laughs> that David had to have been to all these soldiers, all these men of war who had you know experience in battle. He says to the men that stood by him. What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? And whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? Sorry, that... I think I missed with, and with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. So you see Eliab here, assuming he's uh, jumping to conclusions here. Of course, I, I think he's just embarrassed. Here is not just like, you know, a couple years younger. This is his baby brother, seven down or six down from him. Uh, you could say, you know, probably minimum, roughly seven years younger, at least, if not more. And here his baby brother is saying, why isn't somebody doing something about this guy? And Elias probably a little irritated, frustrated. He gets hot under the collar and he says, I know your pride, the naughtiness of your heart. He, 
he assumes David's character. He, he, he assesses uh, what he thinks to be you know, poor character in David. And obviously we know this is not the case in, in David. So you have a poor evaluation of character. <coughs> and so God sees these things. says, uh, he's not a very courageous man. He's not uh, a, a good uh, evaluator of character. And those aren't two uh, character traits that would... Um, be beneficial to a king. Uh, these are negatives. Uh, and another thing, and I think uh, a big one, you could say the biggest one, I, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's just a big, uh, a big issue here. And that is found in verse 29. And David said, what have I now done? In other, like, why are you upset with me? Like, I'm just talking here, uh, just trying to assess what's going on. Why nobody's fighting Goliath? Is there not a cause? So David sees a cause. David sees a purpose for the battle against Goliath to be fought. Eliab didn't see it. And so Eliab here fails to see the bigger cause. Uh, I wrote down, um, if, if you look at the story... I believe Eliab and probably the rest of the nation of Israel, these men, the, uh, the army of Israel rather, they, they saw a national threat. Okay, They see a national threat. David saw a spiritual one. Because what are the results? What, what's, what are the repercussions of this battle? Okay, What's Goliath say? He comes, he challenges the men. You find it here. A couple different times. Verse 9, 17 verse 9, verse 8. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? He's mocking them. He's like, what are you guys going to do? Um, am not I a Philistine and ye the servants, ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. So Goliath says, send me a man. If I beat him, you're going to be our servants. I believe David heard those words. I think that David thought, deeper than the uh, service that he and his nation would be subjected to. The Philistines were pagan. They, were a, they did not worship the true God. They were heathens. They were wicked. If you're the servants to a pagan culture, a pagan nation, there's probably going to be some oppression there when it comes to, uh, you know, I say religious, your, your worship of God. <laughs> I highly doubt if Goliath would have beat David or whoever fought, uh, you know, would have chosen, and this is, you know, alternative here, if, if Goliath would have won this battle, I don't think the Philistines would have been fine with well, you know, we conquered you, you're our servants, but you can just, yeah, you, you know, you're free to worship whoever you want to worship. I don't think that would have happened. Um, there would have been uh, some type of oppression or persecution. And David looks, and it's interesting how when David references the armies of Israel, he mentions the armies of the living God, the armies of the Lord. Uh, several times. He's not just focused on a national threat. He is, he's got his mind fixed on, there's more to this. And so when he says, is there not a cause? It's like he's saying, wake up, people. Uh, there's more to this than meets the eye. This isn't just Goliath 
you know, wins and we're servants. You know, I mean, Israel was no stranger to being uh, under under other nations in, in years past. I mean, you have the whole uh, time of the book of Judges. I mean, they're under, you know, the Midianites and, uh, I mean, on and on. You have nation after nation that the Lord uses to judge them. And so, I mean, I'm just, this is totally, you know, not written in the Bible here. But, uh, you know, you just wonder, what's running through these guys' heads? It wasn't enough motivation for someone to say, I don't want to be their servants. You know, maybe they're just thinking, well, here we go again. You know, somebody's probably going to lose and we're going to be servants again for all the... And David steps up and says, well, like, hold it. Uh, there's a cause here. There's a cause for this battle to be fought. And I believe that David saw a spiritual threat as well as a national threat where Eliab, his older brother, uh, hadn't quite thought things through as well. And so uh, this is a failure for Eliab to see a bigger cause, to see the cause that David saw. And so for these reasons, and you know, probably others, we don't know a whole lot about Eliab, but when Samuel goes to anoint the new king, God says, not him. And all the way down through six brothers. Why? Because God sees the heart. God sees character. God sees whether a person has integrity or not, uh, has a biblical characteristics. And Eliab did not. And so, just as God saw David's heart, God saw Eliab's heart. Eliab wasn't uh, a shock to the Lord. It wasn't like, oh, David has a, an older brother. I guess I didn't realize that. I kind of forgot. Um, God had assessed Eliab. God had probably assessed about every man in Israel. <laughs> and uh, there was a reason he picked David. So David is chosen as the next king of Israel. Uh, verse uh, chapter 16, verse 11. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and withal of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. So David is chosen to be the king. Can you imagine what's running through his brother's heads? Like, he's the runt. He's the baby. He's the annoying little brother, right? Um, and here in the midst of his brethren, Eliab's rejected. Uh, Minadab's rejected. Uh, Shammah's rejected. All the way down through. And they got to be looking at each other saying, you've got to be kidding me. Like, of all of us, David? Um, again, this is not written in the Bible, but I just wonder, you know, understanding family and uh, siblings. And I wonder here because, again, you see Eliab standing there when David's anointed. And later on, when he goes to the battle, um, you just wonder if there's not a little bit of spite, uh, not a little bit of uh, jealousy, yeah, animosity, something just um, going on there. And uh, so he's so quick to jump down his brother's throat. But, you know, who, like, what's he supposed to do? You know, Eliab, God chose David, right? So regardless of uh, what his brethren think, what his father thinks, David is chosen. Uh, as the next king of Israel. Now, excuse me, this does not uh, place David immediately on the throne. There is a period of time, uh, a rather lengthy period of time actually, before David becomes the next king of Israel. Saul has been rejected, but God allows him to reign uh, for a little while longer. And roughly like 15 years between David's uh, anointing, and when he ascends to the throne. And there's a lot that happens in that 15 years. And uh, But 
15 years. You would think, how many times in that 15 years would David have thought back to being anointed the king and think, is this ever going to happen? Uh God said it would. Samuel anointed me. You know, the, the, the Lord is with me, but it just seems like it's not going to happen. And we see later on in David's life where there are times where he doubts the Lord and he steps out of God's will. Um, but uh, just keep in mind, this isn't uh, David gets anointed and then he's the new king. There's a period of time here. So David is uh, newly anointed as king, and of course this oil that Samuel pours on David's head is simply symbolic of uh, you know the Lord's power on David's life, him being chosen. This isn't anything, you know, spooky or weird. Uh, this isn't, you know, holy oil uh, that made a change in his life, and uh, this is just, it's a, it's a symbol. And the Bible says that the Lord is with David from this point on. More so, I believe, than what he was already. This wasn't that you know God was apart from David and and uh, wasn't involved in David's life at all, but you know the Lord just uh, special blessing, special presence in David's life from this point on. So Saul is newly anointed, freshly anointed, or I'm sorry, David is freshly anointed. Saul is freshly uh, rejected at the same time, and Saul's loss of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit power in his life, resulted in. Uh, David's uh, gathering of it. And so David is anointed, and this anointing on David's life, and again, I don't want to uh, be unclear here. There's things that happen, the things that we see in David that you might say things that were affected in his life by the anointing, by his being chosen of the Lord. But I think that these things were, so many of them were already in place, and God choosing David to be king only uh, encouraged him in these ways. It only uh, brought these things to light even more in his life. And so uh, when we say you know, his anointing affected many areas of his life, understand that David already had a walk with God. This wasn't uh, you know, some random kid out in the field that, you know, was clueless about the Lord, and then God sends his prophet to anoint him as the next king of Israel, and, oh, you know, all of a sudden he's a godly man. Um, God chose David to be the king before, uh, you know, before, where was I going with that? He, he chose, uh, he, ch think quick. <laughs> He had already assessed David's heart prior to his anointing. I mean, this is why he is chosen. He's a man after God's own heart. So this isn't, uh, again, that David all of a sudden had a new uh, you know, revelation, a new walk with God at his anointing. It's just, I believe, his uh, character is, is brought to light more, and these things in his life were affected by his walk with God and his anointing. So one of these things that... Uh, I believe is affected by David's walk with God is his music, musically. And we, we know this is uh, consistent with uh, Scripture, because if you look, turn to the book of Ephesians, book of Ephesians, we have the whole book, uh, most of the book of Psalms, written by David. And these are uh, what we understand to be songs that uh, would have been sung so in Ephesians chapter 5, we have a reference here to music being associated with uh, the Holy Spirit. So uh, Ephesians 5, 18, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So if we are filled with the Spirit, it's they go hand in hand. You, not to say that there's never discouraging times in your life where you just don't, I mean, you don't feel like singing. I mean, there are difficult times, but someone who's walking with the Lord, I mean, whether it's in your mind, you know, uh, or out loud, or 
I mean, you're just going to have a song. Uh, the Lord gives the song, and those who walk in the Spirit uh, will have a desire for godly music. And we see this in David's life. And uh, again, not that this anointing necessarily uh, brought this out in David, but just, just to understand that David chose God before God chose David. Um, and when God chose David, it just brings to light more so uh, how godly of a man David was. A young man, uh, if you remember, just, uh, just a young teenager, you know, 12, 15 years old, somewhere in that realm probably, while he's, you know, watching his father's sheep, he's got this reputation at a young age of being uh, a man of valor. He's got a reputation of being skilled on the harp. And his walk with the Lord would have affected uh, him musically. Okay, uh, so th those who, I wrote down here, those who enjoy godly music, I mean truly enjoy from the heart godly music, will not will not enjoy the world's music. And I say enjoy, our flesh wants to enjoy it. <laughs> but those who, you know, have a desire to walk with God, those who uh, truly enjoy godly music, will not let themselves enjoy the world's music. And uh, vice versa, you know, I see, uh, see people come to church sometimes, and I mean, just singing and I mean they're just not there at all or it's just like uh, 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 just totally bored I mean you can see it all over their face and then you happen to you know go by their house and you hear the rock music playing or the you know the modern uh, contemporary Christian Christian rock music I mean it's just and again, not to say, I mean, we all have learning to do. So don't think that I'm, you know, think, you know, that you're some terrible wicked. You know, people have growing. Uh, we're all growing. And so there's times where there's transition, you know, um, when you get to come out of something and you're, you know, trying to serve God, trying to serve God, and you still got that addiction, so to speak, to a sin or, you know, the wrong type of music or a wrong, uh, you know, like someone who's, you know, coming to church and, you know, but they still smoke and they're struggling with it, struggling with it. Does that mean they're not godly or they're not trying to serve God? No. But, you know, there's a time period. There's very few people who can just say, oh, Lord, save me. I'm done with all this. Uh, there's a uh, There's a growing that has to take place. So I'm not saying that you know, there's never going to be any, uh, you know, you come to church and, you know, sing the hymns on Sunday and then throughout the week, you know, you're listening to other things. But as you grow in the Lord, you're going to have less and less of a desire for the world's music. And uh, so the Holy Spirit in your life, if you're walking in the Spirit, it will affect you musically as David was affected. Second area was that he was courageous. Courageous. Um, you don't fight a lion and a bear with your hands <laughs> without, without courage. And you don't step on a battlefield with a nine-foot-tall giant without courage. But if you look at this story, David's courage was not in himself. His confidence was not in himself. He references God over and over again. And uh, the Bible says in Acts 4, 31, again, we see the Holy Spirit associated with courage or boldness. And uh, when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. So the Lord in David's life affected his courage. That's encouraging to me because it's like, I can't do this by myself. You know, I can't witness to this person. And it's, we don't have to have courage in ourselves. We don't have confidence in me, thankfully, because I fail over and over. David's courage was in God. 
and his, uh, this is an area of his life that was affected by his walk with the Lord and by the Spirit's power on his life. A third area is that uh, he had wisdom. Okay, And again, we see these in, in 1 Samuel 16, 18, uh, several of them anyway. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite that is cunning and playing. So we see music. And a mighty valiant man. He was courageous, a man of war, okay, prudent in matters. He had wisdom. He was discerning. And again, this is just a young age, just a young age, a young man, uh, not even old enough to go to battle, uh, you know, to join the king's army, so to speak. He's just watching sheep. And he's got this reputation. And it's only because of God's working in his life, his relationship with the Lord and the Spirit's power on him. Okay, so he was affected uh, in his wisdom. Now, we live in an age where the more and more and more that the world, our country, our churches even reject God, the more devoid of wisdom they become. Because we know that true wisdom only comes from God. And we look at the world around us and say, how can people be so stupid? Well, like, how we need to be careful not to expect too much <laughs> from godless people. Because it's like, how can they have wisdom when they've rejected God? They, yeah, they can't. And so the more and more we become a godless society, I mean, sadly so, I'm not encouraging it, but it's just that's where we're going, and we have been for decades. The more and more we reject God, the more devoid of wisdom we become. And uh, you have people in the world, you know, just, just as an example, because we have a lot of smart people out there. And the Bible says that in end times, knowledge will increase, but knowledge is different than wisdom. And... You have, you know, as an example, you have a lot of, pe there's a lot of smart business people in the world, unsaved people. I mean, just brains. And you might have a financial advisor who is, you know, top of his game, and yet he's still fooled by alcohol. That's not wisdom. That's knowledge apart from God. Uh you know, he doesn't have a, a proper basis for his knowledge. He doesn't have true wisdom. And, uh, you know, you, there's lots of examples of that. But true wisdom uh, only comes from God. And David had wisdom. He was prudent in matters. He was discerning. Okay, So that's uh, a third area that it was affected. Fourthly was his countenance. For Samuel uh, 16, verse 12, uh, we see that he was... Uh, the Bible says uh, he was ruddy and with all of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. Now, obviously, the Lord makes people. Uh, the Lord makes people how He makes them. You know, not everybody's going to be, you know, the best looking person on the planet. Thank goodness, because I'm not them. But <laughs> just the Bible says that. Uh, he was a good-looking guy. He's a good-looking kid, and but I believe there's more to it than this. It wasn't that. Wow, you know, he's just good-looking guy. It was he was a joy to be around. He wasn't. Uh, the Bible says here, uh, verse eighteen, that he's a comely person. He has a reputation of being a comely person. Like he's pleasant. He's. Uh, a joy to be with. He isn't, you know, Captain Negative all the time. He isn't Johnny Raincloud. He isn't, you know, uh, you know, the forever pessimist like I am. <laughs> he's just, he's pleasant to be with. And, you know, there's people in life, I'm sure we, you know, we all know someone. It's just like, they're irresistible. You can't help but like someone, not because that they're, you know, the best looking person on the planet, but just because they're pleasant person you can't they, they they're just enjoyable to be with all right they're they're they've got a great attitude and so uh his countenance you know i'm sure he wasn't walking around with a frown on his face all the time and oh what was me um he's you know a pleasant person to be around he's comely uh that would have been affected by his walk with god 
He had a supernatural reputation, number five. And the Bible says in uh, verse 18 there that the Lord is with him. The Lord is with him. Again, a young man, a shepherd boy in the field, and he had a reputation of the Lord being with him. It affected his reputation. His walk with God affected what people saw him as. Uh, I remember my uh, dad's father working in the mill, and he was known as the preacher. And so he had a reputation. I mean, it wasn't <laughs> that they called him that, uh, you know, it wasn't endearing necessarily, but that's what people knew him as uh, because he would witness. He would witness uh, unashamed uh, for the Lord. So David's walk with God affected his reputation. People understood that he walked with God. Uh, the Lord was with him. Uh, he had favor with men. Uh, David came to Saul and stood before him. This is uh, verse 21. David is chosen to come before Saul and play his harp. David came to Saul, stood before him, and he loved him greatly and became his armor bearer. All right, so David gained favor with the king of Israel, which is hard to comprehend. The Bible says he loved him. He became his armor bearer, and later in his life, he's trying to kill him. But he gained favor with men. And we have Christ's example uh, when he was growing in Luke chapter 2 that he, uh, he grew in favor with God and man as a young boy. And so uh, God in David's life, uh, he had favor with men. Uh, two more here. I know I'm running late, but i got to finish. Number seven is opportunity. He came, uh, he had opportunity. Okay, he they, God being in David's life, God provided him with opportunities, and I mean, a shepherd boy becomes the king's armor bearer. Uh, that probably wasn't common. He's not even old enough to you know be in war, be in battle, and he's the king's armor bearer, and. God provided opportunity uh, for him. And more than ever, I believe our Christian young people have an opportunity to stand out from this world. I mean, be hard work. I mean, all you have to do today is show up to work. And the employer's like, wow, like, that's impressive. They came when they were supposed to come and they, you know, like worked a full day. I mean, it's not hard to stand out today. It's not hard to have opportunity to serve God. And uh, God can provide that. He does provide opportunities for us to witness uh, in several ways. But God provides that. And then lastly, he was a blessing to others. Uh, it affected him. He, David was a blessing to others uh, as he walked with the Lord and had the Spirit's power on his life. And we see that in verse 22. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. It came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. So he was a help to Saul. Uh, and he used his music, his, his harp playing that he had developed in the field that he had learned. Uh, God used that in his life and uh, allowed him to be a blessing to others. So there's uh, several areas where uh, David's anointing or David's walk with the Lord affected his life. And uh, so, look at that. After the double buzzer, and I'm still done with five minutes to spare. Aren't you impressed? It's a good thing they started ringing. I know you're irritated, but you'll get over it. <laughs> it's like, good thing they start ringing it like 20 minutes ago. So, all right, let's pray.